So I'm honored to introduce our special speaker today, Shara, Shara Smith. Shara Smith is a recent graduate of the University of uh, Oklahoma in the United States, where she earned her, a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. Sherry is continuing her education right now uh, and pursuing a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology with a focus on microbial community assembly and host microbe interactions among reptile and amphibian communities in the Philippines and Oklahoma. So ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Shara. Shara? Hi everyone. Um, it's hi, an honor hi. to be here. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, I will share. So today I will be discussing my study um, that was published a few months ago, which examined the microbial ecology of Philippine venomous snakes. Um, but I will also be discussing um, some of my proposed dissertation research, which focuses on investigating the evolutionary processes that are driving microbial community assemblage among reptile and amphibian hosts. So just a little bit about me. I am finishing my second year as a PhD student at the University of Oklahoma in the US. Um, but in 2019, I was awarded a Fulbright Research Fellowship to the Philippines. So in January 2020, I moved to Los Banos because UPLB was my host institution. But of course, because of the coronavirus, um, all of my plans changed as I think everybody else's did as well. Uh, so in March, I had to return to the US when I was originally intended to stay until October. Um, but I was able to lead one expedition to Mount Palali uh, pictured here, and this is some of my field crew that was out there with me, um, which, and if you don't know what Palali is, it's uh, in central Luzon up by Bayambang. So I want to provide some background information that will set up the questions that I aim to address for my dissertation research broadly, but also the study that I'm going to, to break down for you all today. So to begin, I want to describe briefly the theory of community assembly, uh, which is the theory that local communities form when members of the regional species pool disperse into new habitats. And when they disperse, they have to kind of adapt to these filters per se, and the species responses to those filters determine if it persists in the local community. So two of the classical mechanisms that have been proposed to act as drivers of community assembly are environmental filtering and competitive exclusion. These are not the only mechanisms and it is likely that the, they both work together um, to determine community membership. But these concepts provide a framework for thinking about how community ecology, which is the study of the organization and functioning of communities and phylogenetics can integrate to predict how communities form. So under environmental filtering, traits are selected for by the environment so that species without those traits cannot persist in the habitat. Therefore, traits are conserved because the environment is selecting for species with certain traits to persist. So um, that means that species within the community will be phenotypically similar because closely related species phylogenetically will have similar traits and therefore the communities will make up species um, that are phylogenetically similar and phenotypically similar. In contrast, competitive exclusion limits the number of closely related species within a community because under this hypothesis, members of closely related species will have to outcompete one another for access to the same resources, which will lead to communities with more dis distantly related species. And because distantly related species usually look different, communities will be phenotypically dissimilar. So it's likely that the mechanisms determining community assembly among animals are more complicated than originally hypothesized because animals are also hosts to entire communities of microbes. Um, and the impact these microbes may have on host adaptability is largely understudied. 
And these classical hypotheses of community assembly have been applied almost exclusively to macro organisms or multicellular organisms. But these theories may also help us understand how microbial communities assemble. So these microbial communities are referred to as microbiomes and they are fundamental in many processes that benefit their host organism, including immune system function, pathogen resistance, among others. So one of the first large scale projects to characterize host associated microbiomes was the Human Microbiome Project, which launched in 2007. And one aim of the project was to develop laboratory protocols and data analysis pipelines um, to obtain and process microbiome data. And one of the major findings that came from the early microbiome research was that animals are host to actually several different microbiomes, not just one large microbiome. And that's kind of what this figure is indicating. So different parts of the human skin actually have different compositions of microbes. Um, and so that's what this figure here is showing. And here are the different microbial uh, families within the phylum. So with increased accessibility to these protocols and pipelines, the taxonomic scope of microbiome studies expanded to include many different vertebrate taxa, such as frogs, um, lizards, you know, non-human mammals, fishes. Um, but despite their use in addressing many questions in ecology and evolutionary biology, microbiome evolution among reptiles and amphibians remains really poorly understood. And reptiles and amphibians are particularly interesting host organisms because they are incredibly ecologically and morphologically diverse. Um, there are limbed and non-limbed reptiles and amphibians. There are species of the two groups that can glide. Uh, there are reptiles and amphibians that are arboreal, aquatic, some that burrow. Um, and they have a variety of reproductive modes such as live birth uh, versus like laying eggs. And despite this variability, little is known about how reptiles and amphibians acquire their microbiomes. So the amphibian microbiome literature to date has focused mainly on understanding how the skin microbiome defends against pathogens such as chytrid fungus. And chytrid fungus is a fungal pathogen that affects the amphibian skin and particularly affects its ability to res respirate or breathe. And it has caused you know, mass die-offs of amphibian communities around the world. And for this reason, there has been a push for microbiome research um, to be conducted on amphibians rather than reptiles. However, studies that sample amphibian communities across landscapes are relatively scarce, and the current amphibian microbiome literature has sampled only 5% of the world's known amphibian diversity. So the reptile microbiome research to date has focused on um, identifying the microbial diversity along the GI tract, which is the series of organs that begins with the mouth and ends with the cloaca. And um, like this study, most of the studies are, are limited to just a comparison of one species. And so in this study, they um, identified the microbial diversity at different organs. And you can see that um, different organs of the alligator um, do have different compositions of microbes. Um, however, this study, along with all the others, is uh, kind of limited because it only sampled um, captive bred individuals. And the snake microbiome research really is pretty much the same. So it has focused on identifying the microbial diversity along the GI tract, such as this study here, but is limited because um, most snake microbiome studies have been only done on one species um, or of captive bred individuals only. And that really limits our ability to determine the host associated and environmental factors that may be driving microbiome assemblage among these particular host organisms. 
So although there is this baseline data on the composition and diversity of amphibian and reptile microbiomes, microbiomes are incredibly complex and they can be viewed as distinct communities in their own right. So the different members of the microbiome interact and influence one another. So they can be viewed as their own sort of ecological community and they are you know, undergoing horizontal gene transfer, they're changing constantly and evolving along with the host organism. And um, they can also provide insights into host evolution and adaptation because in some groups, um, they can be viewed as a trait of the host that can be sort of passed down from generation to generation. Um, and so it's likely that microbiomes have real ecological or environmental um, implications because um, you know, under kind of that hypothesis, if a microbiome is a trait of a host, then more closely related species should have more similar microbiomes compared to more distant, distantly related host species. So with all of this in mind, my dissertation broadly aims to investigate how microbiomes influence host biology, which in, uh, includes host evolution and adaptability to environmental change or factors of the host's environment. Additionally, I'm interested in the host associated factors that may impact microbial communities. What aspects of the host, its environment that it lives in, its um, close evolutionary history with other hosts, how do those aspects impact the associated microbial communities? Lastly, my research aims to understand the evolutionary mechanisms, particularly how I addressed earlier, kind of environmental filtering or competitive exclusion, how those mechanisms uh, shape microbial community assembly, not just host community assembly. So to kind of begin to address some of these questions, I traveled to the Philippines where you all are. Um, in 2018, and I started the project that would eventually become a publication in the journal Frontiers in Microbiology. This came out just two months ago. Um, and so in particular, I traveled to Kalayan and Kamiga Norte Islands within the Babuyan Island Group, which I'm sure you all know is uh, north of Luzon. And uh, in particular, I was interested in sampling these three host snake species, snake species because they are all venomous and they occupy distinct habitats. So Laticata is a sea crate. So it is a marine snake, whereas Tremeroceros is a arboreal pit viper. So it lives up in the trees. And then Boiga is a more ground dwelling, shrub dwelling snake. But another interesting aspect of these snakes is that they each possess distinct toxins in their venom. So laticata are neurotoxic, meaning that their toxins affect the central nervous system of their prey items. Whereas trimeroceros and most vipers um, are hemotoxic, which means that their their toxin will affect more of like the organs of the host, um, the blood, that kind of stuff. Whereas demotoxin is um, a bird specific toxin, which the function is really kind of not known, but um, it tends to be more neurotoxic in, in nature. Um, but because we weren't able to collect venom samples for this study in particular, we cannot link any observations um, that we found with the oral microbiomes to the venom type in this study, but I hope to address that particular question in a future chapter. So for this study, my core questions were, do the differences in host ecology correlate with distinct microbiomes? So does the aquatic snake have a different microbiome than the arboreal snake? does it have a different microbiome than the ground dwelling snake, that kind of stuff. So does host microhabitat preference or ecology uh, correlate with distinct microbiomes? Kind of contrastly, does um, the host species determine the microbiome differences? So do different host species have different microbiomes? And then lastly, I was interested in kind of um, reiterating what is 
already known or testing a, a previous hypothesis that different snake body sites harbor unique microbiomes. And in my case, it's going to be the oral microbiome versus the gut microbiome. So this is the general methods. Um, so I, you swab the focal body site. So in my case, I swab the mouth and I swab the cloaca of um, 22 individual snakes. And then I extracted the DNA from the swabs. And then I use PCR to amplify the 16S rRNA gene, which is a gene that is found in most microbial species. And so if you have all the DNA in the sample and you're just interested in what, the, what microbes are there, you amplify the 16S rRNA gene because most microbial species will have that gene. And then once you have the DNA, um, amplified, you sequence it on an Illumina MySeq, which is just a super fancy machine that uh, outputs sequence data. And so once you have that sequence data, you cluster sequences into operational taxonomic units, uh, abbreviated OTU. And the OTUs are clustered based on sequence similarity. So sequences that are more similar are going to be clustered into an OTU. And then that OTU is given a microbial taxonomy. So if you, um, and then that can give you kind of a, the, the taxonomic profile or the, um, the relative abundances of the microbial taxa within each sample based on the, the presence of a certain OTU or the abundance of an OTU in a sample. And that can allow you to do diversity analyses. So this is the analysis pipeline that I used to address these specific questions. So the taxa bar plot is basically just um, provides a visual of the relative abundances of, for the microbial taxa within each sample. And it can just give you a visual to see if there's differences. Um, but then I took it a step further and did alpha diversity analysis, which Alpha diversity just measures the microbial diversity within each host species, whereas beta diversity measures the microbial diversity between host species or between host body sites, whatever comparison you're interested in investigating. And um, I won't go into details about the, if anybody has questions about the certain tests, um, basically you just, you just do a certain test um, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, to see group differences. So that's how you can tell if um, the microbiome of the Laticata sample is different from the microbiome of a Trimeraceris sample. So if you're interested in seeing, is it st st statistically significant differences um, between host species? That's why you do um, these other tests. So this is the taxa bar plot for this study. Um, so these are the microbial phyla and up here are gonna be the mouth samples and these are going to be the gut samples. And each vertical bar here is a, a unique sample. And then they're kind of grouped based on the host species. So just by looking at the different relative abundances, you can see that particularly in the gut samples, Laticata, is a lot different than Trimeraceris and Boiga, whereas Trimeraceris and Boiga seem to have a relatively similar um, gut microbiome. But in the mouth microbiomes, really there is pretty a, a pretty wide variability among the host species. So this is kind of the first step. And so when I got these results, I was excited because I mean, there's definitely differences, but of course you have to do the analysis to really find if there's like differences statistically. So these are the alpha diversity results. So just a reminder, alpha diversity is uh, within host species diversity. So there's kind of a, there's a few different metrics you can use. So I used observed OTUs, which is just the number of OTUs, which again correlates to the Micro, the certain microbes that are in the sample. So um, for example, uh, this Boiga 
the three Boiga samples had a lot of OTUs compared to the Trimeroceras, which is in purple, and the Laticata, which is in blue. So this analysis actually yielded a significant difference between the Boiga and Trimeroceras in terms of observed OTUs. Um, and then Bates PD is a um, incorporates a phylogeny of the OTUs to see if um, there, it estimates the diversity of the OTUs um, within each sample. So in this alpha diversity metrics among mouth samples, um, Boiga and was different than Trimeroceras and Trimeroceras was also different from Laticata. And then the Shannon index tells you the number of OTUs, but also tells you how equally abundant the OTUs are across samples. And in this analysis, among mouth samples, every species was different. Whereas in the gut samples, there weren't, I mean, there were, wasn't much variability in terms of the number of OTUs and the distribution of OTUs across the samples. So I, for my study, I present three different beta diversity analysis, but I'll only cover one here because it can get kind of a lot of information. Um, so this is uh, the unweighted unifrac analysis. And um, the different analyses are dependent on the kind of questions you're interested in. So the unifrac analysis uh, incorporates a phylogeny of the microbes in the sample. So if you're interested in if there's phylogenetic differences among microbes, you use a unifrac. Um, but there's other diversity analysis that just tell you, are these microbes different? Um, but I was interested in if they are different, but also phylogenetically, you know, relate closely related or distantly related. So to kind of break this down, this is a PCOA, and it basically just gives you a visual of how um, distinct the samples are based on their microbiome composition. So visually, you can see kind of a divide here in multivariate space between the Laticata, which is in blue, and the Trimeroceras and Boiga samples, which are Trimeroceras is again purple and Boiga is red. So you can see that there's kind of a separation. So compositionally, um, Laticata is pretty different from uh, Trimeroceras and Boiga across both body sites. And um, you can see here that like the Boiga mouth samples, so the mouth, sorry, the mouth are indicated by the triangles and the circles are the gut samples. So um, the Boiga mouth samples seem to cluster more closely with the Laticata mouth samples. Um, and then the Boiga and the Trimeroceras gut samples seem to cluster a little bit closer over here. And this was the group difference analysis that I did. And among mouth samples, Trimeroceras mouth samples were different from uh, Laticata samples. And then among gut analysis, all comparisons were found to be um, statistically significant. So all the, the gut samples among all three species were distinct in their microbiome diversity. So in summary, differences in host ecology did correlate with distinct gut microbiomes, and these snake species did possess species-specific gut microbiomes, and the distinct body sites um, were, did have unique microbiomes. So results from this study, which are again published, um, indicate that oral and gut microbiomes differ among host species occupying distinct habitats. However, these host species also belong to distinct snake families. And uh, so the differences that we observed could be due to the hosts being relatively distantly related, um, or it could be because they occupy, you know, disparate habitats or, you know, another factor that we don't really know yet. So to try to fill in some of these gaps, um, my second chapter of my dissertation will sample four species um, from the subfamily of uh, vipers from the same sub, sorry, this from the same subfamily of vipers from North America. 
particularly in Oklahoma, where I live. Um, so this won't be a Philippine-based project. Um, instead, I will sample these four species that are co-distributed across the state of Oklahoma in the US. Um, so these species can be distinguished based on the presence or absence of a rattle on their tail. So this is a rattle and these two species are rattlesnakes and they are found within this large clade here of vipers in North America that have rattles. And these two species do not have rattles and so they make up this non-rattle clade up here. Um, these two species are within the genus Echistrodon and these two species are within the genus Crotalus. And so by designing this experiment the way I, I'm trying to, um, I hope to compare the microbiomes um, from closely and more distantly related snake species um, to try to address some of the questions that my first chapter really couldn't address. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. And additionally, my study aims to characterize the venom of these four species to test the previous hypothesis that certain rattlesnake species produce neurotoxins in their venom, um, whereas other vipers, including the, the Philippine pit viper, produce hemotoxins in their venom. So the core questions for this study, um, I will test if the oral and gut microbiomes differ among host species occupying distinct environments. So I will sample snakes from many different habitats in Oklahoma to test this specific hypothesis. Additionally, my study includes several within and between clade comparisons of the rattle versus the non-rattle vipers to test if host evolutionary history is actually the primary driver of microbiome differences observed among host snake species. Lastly, I will characterize the venom of these snakes to test if oral microbiomes differ based on the different types of venom that these snakes produce, basically trying to fill the gaps that my first chapter kind of left open. So to address the environment and um, host evolutionary history hypothesis, similar to the study I did in the Philippines, I will collect oral and cloacal microbiome swabs, um, but I will also be collecting one of the venom glands, which is actually a, a tissue behind the snake's eye that actively produces venom. And I'll also be trying to uh, collect a venom sample, so actually milking the snakes to perform proteomics, which is basically just a technique that allows us to identify the types of proteins that are in the venom. And these proteins then provide insights into the type of toxins that these snakes are producing. So then we can see how many of the neurotoxins does this particular snake produce versus like how many hemotoxins. So then that's how you characterize if a snake is hemotoxic versus ne like neurotoxic. So then another future study that I hope to do is actually landing me back in the Philippines and will actually work with amphibians um, to sample the skin microbiomes of whole amphibian communities along elevational gradients in the Philippines. So when the pandemic is over and it's safe to travel again, I plan to return to the Philippines and um, investigate how the composition of skin microbiomes change across elevational gradients spanning multiple mountain sites in the Philippines. So the climatic variation that occurs across elevational gradients um, is known to shape communities of macroorganisms. So if we have our hypothetical mountain here, we should see more diverse um, animal communities at low elevation. And then as elevation increases, we should see higher numbers of endemic species and lower overall diversity. And one mechanism that is proposed to drive this pattern is environmental filtering, um, because at high elevations, the conditions are a bit tougher for animals um, and plants. And so species have to adapt to these kind of harsher environmental conditions at high elevations. And evidence of environmental filtering of microbiomes has been found previously in this study um, of pica gut microbiomes. So 
I don't know if you all have pikas, but they're just basically small mammals um, that live in the mountains. And this study found that microbial diversity increased with increased elevation, which is actually contrary to what we would expect with animals. Usually diversity decreases as elevation increases, um, but the microbiomes did increase in, in diversity. Um, and it actually increased in the, the types of microbes that improve metabolic activity and protect the host against pathogens. So there is this evidence that elevation impacts macroorganisms, but it also may influence um, the host associated microbial communities and may actually select for certain uh, microbes to be present within the host microbiome. And really the, in the Philippines is an ideal setting to conduct this kind of comparative study of amphibian skin microbiomes because the Philippines is a biodiversity hotspot and the mountains that I plan to sample um, for this study will have diverse communities of amphibians for me to sample because I'm, as you know, my second chapter was really, and my first was really specific on, I want to sample these species in particular, but for this chapter, I'm hoping to just sample all amphibian communities. And the four uh, focal mountain sites that I plan to sample are Mount Palali, which I was able to go to in 2020, um, Mount Palai Palai, Mount McKeeling, which you all are very close to geographically, <laughs> um, and, and Mount Bonahau. Um, and I, at these different mountains, which I did at Mount Palali and it worked relatively well, I hope to sample different elevational zones so a low elevation, a mid elevation, and a high elevation to compare uh, the skin microbiomes of amphibians at different elevations to see if we see any evidence of this environmental filtering that was found in the PICA study that I just described. Do we see differences in certain, um, you know, the presence of certain microbes that may help the host perform certain functions, you know, different things like that, just investigating how elevation um, may impact skin microbiomes among amphibian communities in the Philippines. So I'm hopeful that I will return to the Philippines and LB when the pandemic ends. Um, my goal is actually to return in summer 2022. So if any of you all want to go help me sample amphibians on Mount McKeeling, let me know. Um, I will gladly take any help that anybody wants to give. So with that, I want to acknowledge just my Philippine collaborators and my uh, US and, and you know, Oklahoma collaborators and my funding sources. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right, thank you, Shera, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, fairly uh, curious, uh, were there studies before uh, involving um, the microbiome of the Philippine uh, snakes, whether it's venomous or non-venomous, is this a pioneering yeah. Uh, study? Yeah, I want I think it is, and I, mm -hmm. I did a lot of reading trying to uh, prepare to write the manuscript, and I I might have missed something, but I think this was a pioneering study of yeah, microbiomes yeah. of really any Philippine organism. I don't think that this has been done with any Philippine. Um, mammal or reptile mm -hmm. or an amphibian. So it was it was really unique and a great experience to be able to to travel to the Philippines and and do this. Yeah, and that's good to know. Uh, another question before we proceed to our uh, to our quiz. Um, yeah. Um, um, uh, what are the uh, you know the super specialized equipment that uh, are needed to do these uh, kind of studies, and uh, how would they be accessible for, for use. Like, I think we don't have those in the Philippines right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, there is a, so I know that you all, I think do have access to PCRs, but the, the, the main um, machine is the MySeq. And we only have one <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, in our vicinity. It's extremely expensive and it is kind of high tech. Um, but I know that there's means of shipping out samples if you have the, the 
the funds to do that, shipping out to maybe Singapore or Japan. Um, and I know that there's services like that in the US as well, where you can ship and just provide raw samples and people can do the whole process for you. Um, but there is also a kit that um, can actually do the entire library preparation with a Q PCR, which is a quantitative PCR, kind of a different machine. And I know that there's a few labs um, that actually have QPCRs in the Philippines because I had talked about doing maybe a, a short seminar on how to use a, key, a QPCR mm -hmm. um, because that's also the machine that you use to determine um, the presence and absence of amphibian disease as well. So uh, to detect that chytrid fungus that I mentioned briefly, you have to have a QPCR to do that as well. So you can kind of, if, if your lab is interested in both amphibian disease and maybe getting into microbiome research, then you, a QPCR may be a more bang for your buck or a better investment. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, we yeah, have one last question before we proceed to the quiz. Uh, I think this a question from Amit. Uh, I'm Ms., uh, I'll, is, Amit, are you there? Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, Hi, hi. Uh, greetings from India. Um, I'm an amphibian researcher. I work in the Western Ghats. That's a wonderful oh, wow. uh, presentation. Uh, so with respect to, uh, like, if I take a single species of reptile or um, uh, amphibian, uh, with respect to different elevation or geographical area, does the uh, gut microbiome or skin microbiome, especially in frogs, or the oral microbiome, does it vary a lot? And so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, uh, and uh, if I if I want to check the gut microbiome of a frog and or a skin microbiome, uh, do I need to kill a frog, or is there any other uh, ways? Yeah. Okay. So your first question. Um, it's, uh, this is all based on my personal reading um, and experience. So there could be other studies that I've missed. But from my you know, personal reading, the only amphibian skin microbiome study that's been done has been um, across elevational gradients, I should say, um, really only focused on identifying the specific microbes that are known to assist um, amphibians with kind of uh, mitigating or uh, kind of you know, treating the frog for chytrid fungus. So they didn't really do the genomic approach that I mentioned. They actually swabbed the frog and then swabbed the swab on a Petri dish and then actually grew um, or cultured the microbes. So that's another way that you can obtain microbiome data is just by plating the, the swab. And then you can see, and if you're good at identifying um, microbial taxa by eyesight, which I could never do, but, you know, if you're able to identify them, then um, that, you know, you can tell certain microbial taxa based on just their appearance on the plate. So that was the, the one of the only studies that has done this work of amphibians across elevational gradients. Um, and so the answer is I'm not sure because I don't think anybody really has taken the approach of just seeing do amphibian skin microbiomes differ across elevations. I think that in that study, they're really focused on finding the BD inhibitory, you know, or the chytrid inhibitory um, microbes. So that's kind of what I aim to, to look at um, in the Philippine, across Philippine mountain sites is do, you know, do we see a change in the diversity of skin microbiomes across the elevation because, um, you know, amphibians and reptiles are ectothermic. So they, they are, you know, their, their physiology is impacted by their climate. And so, um, you know, if it's affecting the host, you know, you would think that it's affecting the microbes as well. So it really, that is just an area, um, you know, of open research right now. And I think, India would be great because y'all have like some really high mountains. So that would be really cool. Um, the Philippines, I mean, obviously has high mountains as well, but um, that would be really awesome. But so the second question, you do not have to kill the frog. Um, you do not have to. Um, 
basically for the skin microbiomes sample, you just take a sterile swab and rub it on the frog up and down um, like five to 10 times. And then you can preserve the swab, ideally freeze it in like liquid nitrogen or put it on ice or something. Or you can buy like a buffer solution. Um, the one I used in the Philippines was called DNA RNA Shield. It's from Zymo. And um, so that will preserve the, the microbial DNA if you put the swab inside of a tube with that buffer in it. For gut microbiomes across all amphibians and reptiles, you um, insert a swab, a smaller swab into uh, its cloaca. So a frog's, it's gonna just be at the back of the frog between its um, hind legs. And then of the snake, it's gonna be on its um, belly side near its, the end of its tail. And so that's how you collect a, a, gut, a gut sample of the microbiomes. Um, and, then all, and then also preserve that swab in the same means that you're preserving the skin microbiome swab. All right, thank you, uh, Cher, for that uh, answer. And I'm it for throwing that question. So we will proceed with our quiz. We have two more questions uh, uh, at the chat box. So we'll come back to it later. Okay. So Okay, I think we have around 30 to 40 participants already. Uh, let me just uh, give a few more seconds for everyone to, to log in before we start. Okay, uh, fair warning. <laughs> I've seen the questions and I think it needs higher order learning. <laughs> I was All hoping right. that maybe I would cover them in yeah. the talk, but hopefully y'all took notes. <laughs> no, 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 this one would be, you have to explain why. Yeah. Uh, why is that the answer for, for you know for everyone? I will benefit. All right. All right. I will. <laughs> okay, we will be starting the quiz already. Okay. So the first question is this one. So you've got twenty seconds. Oh geez, that's quick for people to have to answer <laughs> that. Oh, that's fast. <laughs> So that's not enough. 20 seconds is not enough. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought that they would have some time afterwards. I don't know. I'm, I just thought... I'm sorry, guys. Oh, but see. Uh, wow, there you OPC, go. There you go. 62% answered uh, both A and D. Let's see uh, our uh, answer. So, so I gave it away already. <laughs> I think you gave it away. So 62% uh, got it right. Uh, the next question is... Competitive exclusion leads to communities of species which are A, B, C, D, and E. Those are the options. And time's up. Let's see the answers. Uh, again, it's uh, the answer both B and C, 57%. So let's see. At least half of you Yay. got it right. Next question. After sequencing, raw sequences are clustered into what? O2s, ASVs, ISOs, and HCEs. And the, let's see. Oh, yeah. 70% no, uh, got it right. I think. They are really oh, sorry. To you. I keep giving away the <laughs> answers. I need to be quiet. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So <laughs> at least seventy percent of you got it right. What's uh, o, what does O two? O the the OTUs is the operational taxonomic units. Ah, so okay. it's just a means of classifying sequences um, to in order to assign them a microbial taxonomy. So mm -hmm. it just gives you an idea of the microbial diversity within the sample or the micro the taxa of microbes present within the samples. All right. And the uh, fourth question in microbiome studies, <laughs> beta diversity measures what? Ten seconds to go. Okay. 
This one was and, a bit tricky. Is it tricky? I tried to trick you. <laughs> All right. And oh, 71 yeah, percent got, got the option D and uh, I think uh, they, they probably reviewed for this. Probably they downloaded the paper first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all read the paper before. <laughs> and the last question is, as elevation increases, I think uh, you have a graphic there uh, of a mountain. <laughs> I think this is a giveaway. So 10 seconds to go. And seventy-two percent uh, answered the right option. So thank you very much. So let's see the leaderboard. Wow, nice. Jeremy Romero, wow, Al Ayoso, Jani, and Paul Ibarra got perfect. And I think uh, Jeremy is the number one because he just used fifty-five seconds to answer everything correct. So. Maraming wow. salamat. Thank you, Jeremy. I hope, uh, I, I don't think uh, Sherry can, uh, can give a, a prize coming from Oklahoma <laughs> right now. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so, uh, thank you very much, everyone, everyone for uh, participating in our quiz. So we have a few more questions here oh, from our director, Dr. Marian De Leon. Um, she thanks you for this very informative presentation. Um, her question is, have you analyzed the functional genes from the microbiome of the snakes that you have uh, analyzed? Um, no, but that is a future area that, of research that I hope to get into. So this was just um, analyzing the 16S gene, but to identify the functional genes, it requires whole genome sequencing, which, um, so in, instead of just sequencing one gene, you're sampling all genomic information in the sample. So that can allow you to, you know, identify the functional genes. So I didn't have the knowledge back then when I was doing in 2018, when I was collecting these samples, because to do the whole genome sequencing, you have to preserve the samples in a different way. Um, more like flash freezing rather than the, the buffer that I used because you need high quality DNA. So um, I hope in uh, my future chapters, it's particularly chapter two um, that I discussed a little bit with the North American pit vipers. I will be in Oklahoma and um, we'll have access to like a field station. Um, and so I'll be able to, to, to freeze samples. So I am hoping to actually identify functional genes of those snakes. Unfortunately, I can't necessarily go back and do the functional genes of the Philippine snakes, but hopefully um, when I am able to travel back over there, that can mm -hmm. be a, a way for me to, um, I can have a way to preserve samples better to do the functional gene analysis. But that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from Ms. Crystalline uh, Makua. Uh, how does the result of the microbiome affect the venomous snakes? Or does this mean that the result is a representative or is a representation of healthy snakes? Oh, okay, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, first, the kind of first question, unfortunately with this data, it's not experimental. So I can't mm -hmm. really link causation. So like, I can't say that this microbiome means the snake isn't healthy or, or you know i can just identify what's there mm -hmm. but um i if you go kind of so i presented the phyla data which is kind of a, a more broad taxonomic grouping but um in my paper i actually have a whole section in the discussion where i went down to the genus level and particularly among the, the philippine pit vipers they had a, a higher composition of um, actually pathogenic bacteria. So bacteria that are known to cause pathogens such as like E. coli um, and particularly in the mouth of one Boiga, it had um, a, a pathogenic bacteria. So it's kind of nerve wracking. If you get bit by a Boiga, you know, you mm -hmm. might actually have a snake bite wound. So there is a lot of research on um, the certain 
microbes that have been found in venomous snake mouths that um, are known to contribute to snake bite wounds. And so a lot of people actually die from the snake bite wound infection rather than the venom. venom. So, you know, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can kind of get an idea of the, the abundance of certain harmful bacteria, but I can't necessarily say that the, the whole microbiome of this snake um, means that it's gonna be healthy or not. Like you mm -hmm. can just identify certain, um, you know, harmful or, you know, target bacteria that are known to be pathogenic. All right, thank you. So uh, Willem Joshua Tan has three questions actually. So we'll just um, wow, okay. uh, uh, get to the first question first. Uh, he's wondering what the microbiome community would look like for Naja and Opiophagus. I think are these the are these species names? Uh, I think that's the what do you call this the the king cobra, Philippine cobra. Oh, oh, okay. especially yeah. the okay, latter. I'm looking at the uh, yeah, having sorry. a highly highly reptile diet. So also wondering why they are not in the study. Yeah, okay. So nausea and the O Ophelagus. Yeah, that one. Um, so I actually have like three studies that did the microbiomes of these snakes in particular. Um, I wish I could just like give them to you right now virtually, but so microbiome studies have been done on these particular groups. Mm -hmm. um, so if like, I, I don't know, I can give you my email or something um, to, and I can send you those papers. Um, so, but I, really the, the aim of my study, why I didn't include those is um, because I was on, you know, a small island and I'm not sure if the if species of those genera are on Kalayan and Kamiga Norte islands. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure, but the um, species that I chose for the study um, were based on the different habitats that they had, but also just the availability of the species on those islands because they are so isolated um, from like mainland Luzon. Um, and so really, I think the overall reptile and diversity on those islands is relatively low compared to the rest of the Philippines. Um, so that's why I didn't include those. Um, but yeah, I can find a, I don't know how to find a way to give you my email, but I can, I can send you those papers that targeted those, those species if you're interested. Okay. Thank you. So his second question is, um, do you plan to identify these microbes via species level or use other genes like protein coding genes to identify them later? Yeah, so kind of the same um, thing I was just talking about with the functional genes. Um, I, it's hard with 16S to get at species level identification of microbes because the particular pipeline that I use re relies on a, on a database and sometimes certain microbial species aren't present within that database. Um, just because there's tri I mean, trillions of microbial species, they're so, they're so diverse. So with the whole genome sequencing not being constrained by just the 16S gene, then um, you're able to more accurately identify the microbial species. Um, so that's, uh, um, again, a future research, that that's the goal, um, not relying on 16S, but rather the whole genome sequencing approach. All right. So um, Willem was actually browsing your paper and he saw Laticauda, Careta, and Alligator that they have uh, a same bacterium phylum called Epsilon bacteria. Yeah. Yota. Wow. Oh, okay. Do you think so? really? You're on it. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Okay, cool. He's yes. there. <laughs> that yeah, you are there. Okay. Go into the lit sided. Go and you you'll find the papers that I'm talking about that sampled uh the nausea and the other genera that you're interested the host genera that you're interested in. It's there. Um so go into the I think it's a one of the last sections of the discussion and you'll find where I start talking about those those particular genera of hosts. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 
Okay, anyway, yes. And that was something I completely forgot to talk about um, when I was talking about the tax of bar plots where you can see visually the relative abundance of the different um, bacteria phylum. That, the epsilon bacteriota is a really interesting find because it really was found in more aquatic host species. So the laticata is a marine snake. Um, the caretta is actually the sea turtle. And then alligator is a more aquatic host species as well. Mm -hmm. And then that bacterial phylum wasn't found in any, either of the ter terrestrial um, host species that I sampled or any host species that's terrestrial that I read about. Like, I don't think that Epsilon bacteriota has been found in any terrestrial animal. And so the fact that we, that I found it in um, the Laticata microbiome and it's found in uh, the sea turtle and the alligator, it, it could mean that that particular phylum is associated with more aquatic environments, maybe something in like the water or mm -hmm. like the, the particular rocks that, you know, that they, the aquatic organisms may live on or the, the fish that they eat. A lot of caught at our eel specialists. And so um, maybe something about their diet has to do with the presence of that particular phylum or members of that phylum. So it could be a number of things, but that is so cool that you actually read my paper first and then <laughs> that you pointed out that that was, that was a huge, actually a huge find of the study. So that's really awesome. All right. Thank you. So thank you, Dan. Uh, Willem? Uh, this one, uh, this uh, simple question com comes from Jenemar Salon. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, how do you, how does uh, the snake uh, shoot venom or inflict venom? Probably just give a brief description. Yeah, so um, how it injects venom. I don't know the specifics really. So uh, this is going to be a broad uh, description, broad, but yeah. yeah so um, really it kind of depends on the snakes, this particular snake, but um, with the pit viper, the fangs are in the front, whereas with the boiga, they're rear fanged. And so um, the orientation of the fangs matters. So like boiga, the prey item has to get actually into the mouth before it can inviminate. Um, whereas like a Tremeroceris can actually actively like strike. Um, and so then the venom gland that I talked about. So it's actually just a tissue that's right behind the snake's eye and the venom travels from the gland into the fangs and then it's ejected um, from the fang into the, the organism. So yeah, that's the basic idea. And it kind of matters on the orientation of the fangs, um, whether the prey item enters the mouth before it's inviminated or the snake actually bites down and like, uh, attacks the prey item. Okay, I hope uh, January you were able to visualize uh, what uh, yeah, uh, it's Sarah hard was uh, talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's Google also. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, 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 I think this one is a comment actually from our director, uh, Dr. Delion. Uh, thank you, Shara. Uh, you may want to try Picrust for uh, predictive yeah. analysis of the functional genes using the 16S RNA sequences yes. that you already have. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And so um, <laughs> it's it's just a, a software program that you mm, can I use. See. And I, I just found out about it relatively recently. So I will think about implementing that because um, I think it could, could give us some additional insights that might be interesting. So it's just another one of those kind of analyses that you can do um to to further investigate the data all right okay from thermo mark christian uh the question is can we use the skin microbiome of, of uh, the amphibians or any other animal to assess the health of their ecosystem would that be possible would there be a correlation after all hmm i really thought about it like that yeah that's um so i know that there is um, the, the hosts and particularly amphibians, the skin microbiome is shared with the, the animals like immediate habitat. So like there is sort of some microbiome sharing going on between the amphibian skin microbiome and like the environmental microbiome. So there is some of that. 
going on, but I'm not sure if like the inf certain like bacteria on the skin of amphibians actually improve the environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe or, I'm not, or is it I an don't indicator know. of their environment. Like, for example, oh, if, you yeah. see, if you see a bacterium on the gut or uh, mouth of a certain snake, would you say, would it be safe to say that the, for example, the habitat they are staying in right now are like polluted or yeah, stuff I'm not stuff sure. Like that. That's that's a really interesting idea, mm -hmm. and I I'm not sure that that link has been found mm -hmm. yet. Um, but that's a really interesting idea, especially since like frogs are kind of indicators of ecosystem health because they're so you know if a frog has multiple limbs, then there's probably something going on in the water, you know. So um, yeah, that's an interesting idea that maybe the I, I I've only thought it one way, like the environment definitely, you know, probably impacts the skin microbiome amphibians, but you know, is there microbiome sharing between the two that also benefit the environment? I haven't thought about that. That's a really <laughs> interesting question. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, this is another uh, question from Jenimar. Uh, if you happen to know, uh, or from, you're familiar with the snake uh, lump Lumpenus lampretiformis. Uh, would you know how to determine the sexual maturity? Oh, um, sorry. I'm trying to look it through the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. Sexual maturity. Oh, I'm not sure what that species of snake is. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure how to determine the sexual maturity for that specific species. I, I haven't heard of that. Right. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. So from uh, from Kirk Tarai. So uh, thank you for that wonderful and very informative uh, presentation. He is asking if there are other biological factors which affect the microbiome of these uh, reptiles and amphibians, such as uh, sex, age, and reproductive condition. So again like the the reptile and amphibian microbiome is so limited at the moment so like with the amphibians it's mostly focused on um the microbiome's relationship with pathogens and then mm -hmm. with the reptiles and amphibian or reptiles in particular it's um, more of like a gi tract um different organs have different microbiomes um those kind of comparisons so i don't know if there's been any like experimental design of like this a female snake has a different microbiome than a male snake but in human microbiomes are uh there's like a a huge amount of literature that um really has determined so many things that like your microbiome changes with your age so you start out with like a really small diversity of microbes and then as you age um you get more microbes, you acquire more microbes mm -hmm. as you age. And then as you get older, your microbiome actually decreases in diversity. So um, there is kind of evidence of succession in human microbiomes. Um, and then also like the method of birth of a human changes your microbiome. So if you're birthed through like natural okay. <laughs> means um, or Sicilian, <laughs> like the C-section, where the mother is like surgically, the baby is surgically removed from the mother, that actually changes the baby's microbiome as well. So there are, a, there's a lot of, of research out there about humans and how different aspects of humans and age and, you know, ways of birth change, um, change the microbiomes. But I, do, I don't think those same things have been applied to reptiles or amphibians yet. Um, but again, that makes them such interesting host organisms. There's this just this breadth of uh, data that could be obtained if if people were interested in doing so. Yeah, I think, uh, for example, uh, maybe in the future there will be studies like uh, thinking of uh, exploring whether microbiome differs from snakes to snake and uh, whether they are uh, there's they've been delivered through live birth or through yeah. eggs, right? Exactly. Yeah, because I mean, reptiles—you have the 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 egg birth, the mm -hmm. ovo 
oviparous or whatever, and then you have the viviparous, the live birth, and you have the ova viviparous, where you know you're the the baby develops within the egg and then yes. hatches. So there's just these different mechanisms of snake reproduction that could influence the microbiome. Um, you know, do a, a does a baby snake developed in an egg share a microbiome with the egg? or mm -hmm, with the mother mm -hmm. and then like as a snake birth live from the mother have a more similar microbiome to the mother and not to the s snake born in the egg you know there's all these different things that could be you know looked at and with like potty mantis in the philippines uh, a direct developing frog rather than a frog that's yeah. you know in birth in an egg do those you know do, do different potty mantis their potty mantis have different microbiomes than like you know, a plipidates or something like that, um, that has a different reproductive mode. And that's yeah. a very interesting uh, field. Yeah, uh, for yeah. Everyone, you know, especially budding um, biologists there, herpetologists, and even microbiologists can look yeah. at that, uh, you know, research area in the future. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Again, again, from Willem, uh, will there be studies in the future about uh, non-venomous snakes and also omnivorous reptiles in the Philippines like uh, Quora uh, amboinensis hmm. and Hydrosaurus postulatus. Uh, hmm. um, yeah. Since it is interesting, uh, iguana, for example, has microbes that help them uh, digest fiber. Yeah. So um, the the answer is there. There has been microbiome studies of non venomous snakes um, and like other reptiles that are. are are, you know, when I think hydrosaurus, I think of like anolis lizards in like the neotropics. There has been microbiome studies done on um, anolis lizards um, that found that there were differences in like, in the anolis is like kind of a, a famous example of adaptive radiation where the, the different species develop different limb lengths depending on its position in the tree. You know, there's all these different like microhabitat differences of anolis lizards. Um, and so there was a difference in the microbiomes. So um, with hydrosaurs in particular, there that's such an interesting organism in, in, in itself that just doing maybe like a more in-depth analysis on the functional genes would be super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, I haven't even seen the Corora is like the the turtle, right? Turtle, it's a turtle. Yeah, a turtle. Yeah, I haven't even seen one of those. So I think that those would be hard to come by, yeah. the hydrosaurus and the turtle. But if you find enough sample size, mm -hmm. that would be super cool to do a really in depth analysis of, you know, the functional genes of those microbes to see if they're, you know, helping the host in any way with like digestion of fiber and things like that. Yeah. So uh, another, I think we have more questions here. Renan John Leoncito is asking, uh, will you be having future studies uh, comparing the microflora of the same species that you have mentioned, but with, uh, but with different site collections? Yeah, I would be super interested in doing a follow-up, mm -hmm. um, just in doing things a lot differently this time um, and collecting more information that, from the snakes, the, the like Laticata, Tremeroceris, Boiga. I think that doing a, a, a follow-up would be so powerful because I found these differences, but like, do those hold up? Um, you know, again, if I just repeat the study, like, do we see the same differences? That would really give power into like, the, the differences I observed weren't just flukes. Like these are, you know, these are different in, in their microbiome composition. So I think doing a follow-up would be super interesting. The limiting factor is Laticata. Um, Boiga and Tremeroceris, you can find uh, everywhere. I, I want to say like everywhere, like everywhere in the Philippines. Um, and the Laticata is, is I think the more difficult species to find. So others, site with as many Laticata as we found, I think would be difficult, but I would be super interested in doing a follow-up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So uh, from Maria Delia Arfuertes, um, uh, 
Our comment is the diversity of the venomous and non-venomous snakes in the Philippines is very uh, remarkable. So the question is, um, are there any institutions or organizations that are probably, you know, which are involved in protecting these species for their survival? Um, uh, I don't know if you know uh, these organizations from uh, here in the Philippines, but at the, you know, in your area or in a global organization, would you happen to know? I don't. I, I'm not familiar with any particular organiz or organization that's focused on these particular snakes mm -hmm. um, in the Philippines or broadly. I, I think that the only really reptile focused, um, other than like the loggerhead sea, sea turtle, you know, uh, effort mm -hmm. is like um, the Philippine crocodile. Um, yeah. The I, I forget the 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 gen the um, the monitor lizards. I think so. Yeah, the monitor lizards like helping intervene from like them being consumed. Um, I know there's a lot of efforts in like China, but I'm not like I'm not familiar with any like snake specific. Yeah. Um, Probably it could be. Or the Philippine the, crocodile. The, I said alligator. The Philippine crocodile. Crocodile. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably it could be, the, you know, um, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, snakes, they don't think that it's a, uh, consider it as a charismatic species. Yeah. So I don't know if most of people are afraid of snakes. Yeah, I think, yes, it is kind of like a, a public conception mm. that snakes are scary and snakes are bad. Um, and I have a friend that lives on, um, Palawan and mm -hmm. she sends me like pictures of like Philippine cobras that get into her yard all the time. And they're like thought of as like pests there, yes, you yes. know? Um, and I think for, they affect crops, you know? And so I think that they're just more of like a nuisance for people than mm -hmm. like something really interesting to be conserved. Um, and so it's less of like the food aspect for snakes and more of just like these things are annoying, like to get them out of here. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's really, I mean, globally, if there's a push for conserving snakes, I, I don't know if that's a really big, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, conservation really drive for people. I think it's like monitor lizards and, you know, Philippine crocodiles and these more, you know, big turtles. Uh, turtles what? yeah turtles yeah. um yeah those are the kind of big uh um charismatic like you said interesting sort of looking uh, reptiles that people mm -hmm. are interested in conserving um all right yeah. so uh uh dr de leon is hoping that uh if, if it's possible maybe you can conduct a workshop in partnership with our institution the museum from the yeah, uh, it's like a, from the collection with the samples to bioinformatics of the microbiome of reptiles and amphibians. So, yes. Uh, yes. Actually, 100%. according to her, uh, the museum is now establishing a bioinformatics lab as part of our uh, program on caves. So it's uh, of course we will find uh, snakes in uh, in caves, and we have a regional program on the assessing uh, assessment and. Uh, uh, research ex exploration of uh, caves in uh, our region, in region Calabarzon. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, any help that y'all need, that is, that is amazing. I would give, I'll give you all of the software I use, everything. I, I would be happy to host a bioinformatics or just even a general coding yeah, yeah. workshop, you know, anything you all need, I'd be happy to, to do that. Um, that would be awesome. I'm so excited that you all are getting involved <laughs> in that. That is a that is so cool. So cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes. uh, a, a question a question from Nikki Mata. Is there a reason why you chose the mouth and cloaca as the body site for sampling instead of the, you know, around the mid gut, like the stomach or intestine of the snakes? So to get the stomach or intestines, you, you do have to kill the, the mm. organism and dissect it. Um, and so with these particular organisms, I wasn't interested in, in really cutting them open and, and, you know, doing all of that. So this is more of like, um, you know, a way to sample the, the organism without really destroying the specimen, yes. if, that, if that makes sense. So like, I do work for the Sam Noble Museum. So we do um, 
collection-based research, but you want to preserve the specimen in a way that it can it can be, um, you know, not having its organs falling out in the jar, you know? So, um, and these species are so, um, especially the Laticata are so rare and we just really wanted to preserve them as specimen. So that's why we didn't cut them open and do all of the, the intestines, but they're actually, we did, um, there was certain, I think, oh, oh, the vine snake. I forget the scientific mm. name. The vine snake, uh, Hetula is the genus, Hetula. We, we did do, we did um, actually collect some of the, the, the stomach, a small and a large intestine portion of some of Hetula and some, some, uh, oh, I'm Lycodon, <laughs> Lycodon. There's these, like, just these, just these like, I mean, broadly found, really common yeah, snakes. Very common um, snakes. We did, yeah, we did do, um, we did collect some of the other um, organs in the GI tract to do a comparative study. Um, and I'm actually thinking about uh, processing those samples this summer as well um, to see if, um, you know, microbiomes differ along the GI tract of, of those snakes in particular. So with the the snakes for the first study we really wanted to preserve those specimen because they're so cool and unique and um with the more common species though we did collect um samples of of the gut the the high the mid gut and hind gut right so this will be the final question so uh is salmonella common in the cut of uh reptiles would you know or because uh, some reptile hobbyists say that it is not while health organizations say that it is <laughs> something to be uh, worried about oh i don't remember off the top of my head if we found salmonella in the microbiomes of the snakes that i sampled um and it doesn't ring a bell as something that I found in the literature that is like blindingly like salmonella is bad and we found it and here it is, it's an issue. So I don't know off the top of my head if that's if that's an issue, but it could, I mean, it could be if somebody were to look in depth in that. When I did the kind of in-depth analysis of the, the, at the genus level of microbes to identify the pathogenic bacteria in the mouth. I was focused on comparing to the known uh, literature of the mouth microbiomes. And so I don't believe in my study if I compared the, the, the gut bacteria at the genus level. So I'm, I'm not sure if salmonella is super common no. or not, um, but yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm not really sure. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, to all our par participants and those who answered, uh, uh, who threw their questions. And thank you, Shara, for uh, being with us today. Yeah. Yes, of super, course. Super, super great uh, talk with you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank before, you so much. Before we end our program, let me just uh, give you our virtual certificate of uh, recognition. Let me just, oh, uh, nice. <laughs> let me just share my screen. Yay. Uh, yay. So uh, from the Museum of Natural <laughs> History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension, um, the Certificate of Recognition is being awarded to Shara N. Smith for serving as our resource person during uh, today's uh, 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar um, entitled The Microbial Ecology of Philippine Venom Snakes, held today. Uh, May 5, 2021, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time, yeah, via Zoom. And uh, when we, in with this word of, the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is hereby uh, affixed. So in uh, Tagalog, maraming salamat, Shera. Yes, thank very salamat. much. Thank you so thank much. You. Okay. And um, let me just uh, give a public service uh, announcement. Uh, I, probably you know Everyone knows that uh, we are celebrating the quincentennial uh, here in the Philippines. It's already 500 years since the victory at Mactan. And uh, the program for the University of the Philippines, we have a Gahum Sabuot, Tindig at Pamana ng Bayan. Here at UPLB, uh, particularly the Museum of Natural History, we will have uh, Balik Tanaw, uh, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan. Uh, 
And uh, it's a webinar series. Uh, do check out these days from May 17 to September 22. We have uh, 10 webinars. It will be happening every every two weeks. And it will tackle more of the you know, historical perspectives in, in terms of natural history research in the Philippines. And we hope that you could join us in one or all of these uh, uh, webinars that we will schedule uh, by, by, by next week. So again, um, do visit our website, mnh.uplb.edu.ph or write us at our email, mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. We are on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Like, follow, and subscribe to us, especially in on our YouTube channel. Just go look for the handle UPLB Museum, and we will be uploading our uh, recording later. So to those who were um, uh, uh, expecting us to be live in Facebook, I'm really sorry for that. So just uh, go to our YouTube channel later. And um, check out our articles, UPLB Museum at uh, Museum of Natural History at uh, in Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. So, maraming salamat. With that, uh, we're ending the program. Shera, once again, thank you very much for being with us. And we hope to uh, see you in the yeah. near uh, future. Uh, we, yes, let uh, me know about that bioinformatics. Yes, seminar. yes. I would, of I would course, be happy. Of course. Okay, okay so, thank you all so much. Thank you to okay, our audience. Bye. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Bye.